So thank you to the organizers for the invitation to this uh, symposium. And uh, I've referred from the earlier presentations that gave a very comprehensive overview about the current approaches to mitochondrial DNA engineering. So today I'll be sharing with you our recent work on developing a CRISPR-free system for mitochondrial-based editing. And we hope that this form of precision genome editing can be a useful addition to the existing toolkit we have right now. So precise genome editing of um, your cells and your nuclear DNA can alter the biology of a given animal. And one organelle that has remained outside the reach of precision genome editing is the mitochondria. So each of your cell contains hundreds of mitochondria with each organelle containing several to dozens of copies of your double-stranded uh, mitochondrial DNA. And these DNA sequences within the mitochondrial DNA can vary between the copies to give rise to a phenomenon known as heteroplasmy. And despite being only 16,000 base pairs long, the mitochondrial DNA encodes for essential protein and RNA components that are important for mediating energy production within a cell. So because of the very oxidative environment within the mitochondria, as well as the low fidelity of the mitochondrial DNA polymerase, mutation rates in the mitochondria tend to be higher than in the nucleus. So shown here are just some examples of the grievous genetic conditions caused by mutations in the mtDNA, as well as the associated pathogenic SNP. Um, there are many other point mutations out there that have yet to be characterized for an association to a particular disease, but out of the confirmed pathogenic uh, mitochondrial DNA SNPs, about more than 90% of them could, in principle, be corrected by a precise CG to TA edit or an AT to GC edit. So current approaches to mitochondrial DNA engineering mostly rely on using neonucleases to selectively target the mutant DNA for double strand breaks and thereby resulting in a destruction. The cell then repopulates its mitochondrial DNA pool by using the remaining wild type uh, DNA copies as a template for replication. And while this method has been very effective in altering the heteroplasmy of a cell in favor of the wild type healthy DNA copies, they cannot be used to introduce specific nucleotide changes in the mitochondrial DNA or what we term as precision genome editing. So our lab has developed a variety of uh, CRISPR-based tools that enables targeted nucleotide changes to be made in the nuclear DNA. So shown here are some examples. So on the left-hand side, for the cytosine base editor, or otherwise known as CBE, it is able to make a CG to TA edits, and the adenine base editor can make AT to GC edits, and the prime editor can uh, introduce all possible types of DNA point mutations, small insertions, as well as small deletions. So while these CRISPR systems have been very effective on nuclear DNA, um, to our knowledge, they have thus far not been applied successfully to edit the mitochondrial DNA, and in part due to the challenges of delivering the guide RNA into the mitochondria. So our goal was to develop a CRISPR-free platform that would enable for the precise editing of mitochondrial DNA. And to, uh, to develop such a system, we would require new proteins with novel enzymatic functions. So over at the University of Washington, Professor Joseph Mogus and Dr. Marcos de Morias isolated a previously uncharacterized uh, bacterial toxin from the pathogen Bacholderia sinocetacea. And this toxin was predicted to be a deaminase protein, uh, which they refer to as DDDA. And DDDI, it's its downstream antitoxin immunity protein. So when the team overexpressed DDDA in E. coli, and what they found was that surprisingly, DDDA drastically reduced the viability of the E. coli cells, whereas deaminases that target the single-stranded DNA cytidine, free cytidines or tRNA adenines had little impact on viability. So this result suggested that the substrate of DDDA could be very different from those of previously characterized deaminases. To define the substrate scope of DDDA, the team then solved the cold crystal structure of the deaminase toxin shown in purple, along with its antitoxin protein shown in gray. 
in true structural homology studies, they found that APOBEC3G was the closest structural relative to DDDA. And using APOBEC3A, or otherwise known as A3A, as a proxy for A3G, they then performed in vitro deamination um, assays. And as expected from members of the APOBEC family, A3A deaminated single-stranded DNA, but not double-stranded DNA. And what was unusual and perhaps uh, surprising was that DDDA had no activity on single-stranded DNA, but operated only on double-stranded DNA. And this is a feature that has so far not been reported for any known cytidine deaminases. So the team then went on to further validate the deamination properties in E. coli. When they overexpressed DDDA in E. coli, they found that strains containing the active deaminase had a hundredfold higher C to T mutations compared to strains that express the uh, catalytically inactive deaminase, or otherwise known as DDDA. DDDA. And when they looked at the positions of these mutations, they found that most of the cytidines, or mutated cytidines, were preceded by a thymine in the five prime uh, position. And this strong five prime TC preference of the deaminase was supported by in vitro assays, as shown here when you get deamination if n equals t, but not when it's um, the other nucleotides. So as I mentioned earlier, um, the CRISPR base system that performs C to T editing on nuclear DNA, or known as CBE, relies on a Cas9 protein to generate a single stranded DNA bubble. And cytidines within that single stranded DNA are then deaminated to form uracil. A uracil is read as a thymine by the DNA polymerases in your um, uh, repair processes to result in a permanent CG to TA edit. So we wondered if, given this unique property of DDDA to deaminate double-stranded DNA, could we develop a, an equivalent cytosine base editor, which does not require CRISPR or guide RNAs for programmable DNA binding, and thereby rendering such a base editor uh, amenable to editing of the mitochondrial DNA. So one of our early studies uh, was to first validate the activity of DDDA in human cells. And to do that, uh, we fused DDDA to a, a Cas9 protein to just rapidly localize it to a target DNA uh, within the nucleus of a cell. And what we found was that these DDDA fusions had lower cell viability compared to cells that were treated with um, the standard CRISPR-based CBEs as shown by the lower purple bars compared to the uh, red bars. And we predicted that this was perhaps not surprising given that the uh, toxin was originally, its native function is used as an antibacterial uh, warfare agent. So to overcome the toxicity of DDDA, we decided to split it into two inactive halves. And these halves would reassemble to give the active DMNAs only when bound adjacently on your target DNA. And this mode of reassembly is analogous to the reconstitution of FOC1 nucleases used by zinc finger nucleases as well as talents. So using the crystal structure of DDDA, we identified seven sites within loop regions of the proteins that could serve as potential starting points for splitting the protein. And for our screen, um, we would fuse each half of a protein to orthogonal Cas9 proteins, uh, each half of the split DDDA to orthogonal Cas9 uh, proteins. And any splits that reassembled into an active protein would result in a C to T edit within this space, double-stranded uh, spacing region, which could then be read out by high throughput sequencing. So even though our eventual goal was to develop a CRISPR-free platform, Using Cas9 for this screen allowed us to rapidly test the active to test the splits against a variety of spacing region lengths to find one that could support deamination. If we were to perform such a similar screen using zinc finger proteins or talons, the throughput could arguably be lower since a separate uh, DNA binding protein has to be designed for a given site. So from our uh, screen, we identified two sites within the protein that uh, gave, rise, gave rise to active splits. 
So they were G1333 and G1397. So these splits gave an average of 20 to 50% nuclear DNA editing at the most highly edited spacing region positions. But uh, one caveat is that the editing efficiencies depended on a few factors, namely the length of the spacing region, the position of the C within the spacing region, as well as the fusion orientation of DDDA. So for example, using this highlighted TCT uh, sequence as an example, uh, this TCTs has the highest editing efficiency uh, when it's uh, uh, in the presence of a G1397 split. And specifically, it's when the C terminus half of the DDDA is fused to the right-hand side of the uh, spacing region. Or it's fused to a Cas9 protein that binds to the right-hand side of this spacing region. And in addition, the editing efficiency is the highest uh, in the 44 base pair spacing region compared to a 17 or 23 base pair uh, spacing region. So having identified the active splits, our next step was to move towards a CRISPR-free platform. And we decided to fuse each half of the DDDA to a tail protein pair that has previously been reported by Professor Carlos Morales' group to bind to the mitochondrial ND6 gene. And we performed a few reiterations of the um, an architecture and ultimately settled on this optimized version where starting from the end terminus, you have the mitochondrial targeting uh, signal to localize the editor construct into the mitochondria, a tail repeat array to dictate the DNA binding site, a two amino acid linker, your DDDA half, and one copy of a uracil glycosylase inhibitor protein, or otherwise known as UGI, to suppress uracil repair. And together, these two halves form the mitochondrial base editor, which we call it as DDCBE, and the gene size of DDCBE is slightly under six kilobases. Since DDDA can deaminate cytidines on either DNA strands, um, uracil repair on opposing DNA strands could result in double strand breaks and potentially lead to indels. So we found that uh, as expected or uh, for the CRISPR based uh, CBEs, as well as a DDCBE that was repurposed to bind to a nuclear gene uh, CCR5, we saw that an average of one to 3% indels as shown by the uh, light gray, the, the gray bars here. However, for the DDCBE that was designed to bind to the mitochondrial gene ND6, we could not observe any detectable levels of indels. And in addition to the low indels associated with DDCBE editing, the percentage of edited products that contain the desired C to T edit was very high, with very little byproducts, uh, which consisted of the undesired C to non-T edits. And the low indels and high product priority is consistent with a previous study that used free apoback enzyme to randomly mutate the mitochondrial DNA in Drosophila. And the results uh, support a model of mitochondrial DNA repair in which processes that normally lead to indels and byproducts in the nuclear DNA are likely inefficient in the mitochondria and any double strand breaks uh, will probably result in the degradation of mitochondrial DNA. To demonstrate the generality of DDCBEs, we designed seven other uh, variants to target different sites within the mitochondrial genome. And each DDCBE was tested in its four possible split orientations, shown by the red and blue bars here. So on average, we observed a range of editing efficiencies between uh, 10 to 40%, again, depending on factors such as the split orientation, as well as the position of the cytidine within the spacing region. So analyzing the edited sites uh, gave an idea of the approximate editing window for DDCBEs. So if you want to use DDCBEs to install a point mutation, you first position your target base within the blue or red windows then count out 14 to 18 base pairs and design your tail, uh, tails to bind to the sites flanking this spacing region. So 
So given the high turnover of mitochondrial DNA, we wondered if the base edits that we installed could persist over multiple cell divisions. So we performed an 18-day time course study where we treated uh, hex cells with different variants of DDCBEs designed to target different sites uh, within the mitochondrial genome. And we found that the viability of cells treated with DDCBE were comparable to that of uh, cells treated with the dead DDCBE controls. And in, uh, in addition, we found that the edits were maintained throughout our time course of 18 days, even after the expression of the editor protein stop uh, by day 12. And mitochondrial base editing also appears to have little impact on the integrity of the uh, mtDNA. So we performed qPCR and observed that the relative mtDNA levels of cells treated with DDCBEs remained steady. And when we PCR amplified the whole mitochondrial genome as two separate amplicons, we did not observe any large systematic deletions within the mitochondrial DNA. And given that we know very little about the uh, repair processes that occur within the mitochondria, uh, we wondered if the replication of mtDNA was required for DDCBEs to install a permanent edit. And to do this, uh, we induced the expression of a defective mitochondrial DNA polymerase uh, to arrest DNA replication, as shown by the decrease in the mtDNA levels in the presence of the, de the defective polymerase. And when replication was stalled, we found that a, a sharp decrease in the levels of C to T editing suggesting that replicative polymerases are likely needed to resolve the UG intermediate and into the desired TA base pair. We also treated uh, untransformed human primary fibroblasts with DDCBEs and observed efficient levels of C to T conversion. And, and these uh, human primary fibroblasts are known to divide much more slowly than the immortalized cell lines that we've been using for other experiments, such as HEC293T and U2OS cells. So given that the mitochondrial DNA replication occurs even in non-dividing cells, uh, we hypothesize that DDCBE can operate in non-dividing human tissues as well. So as with any genome editing tool, uh, it is important to assess the off-target activity of the um, editor. And to do that, uh, we used a tag seq to sequence the entire mitochondrial genome with an average coverage of up to 9,000x per base, uh, 9,000 9, x per base. And we found that in particular, there was a one variant of DDCBE that um, showed unusually high levels of off-target editing. And this was perhaps not surprising because the N-terminal domain of this variant was previously known to bind to DNA promiscuously. For the uh, remaining test, uh, for the remaining um, DDCBEs that we tested, in general, we observed background levels of off-target um, editing that were comparable to that of the, the dead uh, editor controls. And in particular, we did not observe any off-target editing for this tail-free DDDA split, suggesting that DDDA is unlikely to spontaneously reassemble in the absence of a DNA template. So the nuclear genome uh, contains pseudogenes that bears uh, great resemblance to some of the mitochondrial genes. So shown here are three examples of the nuclear, uh, nuclear pseudogenes and their mitochondrial counterparts. And the difference and the nucleotide differences um, are highlighted in red. So across the three tested uh, nucleus, uh, nuclear pseudogenes, uh, we did not observe significant nuclear off-target editing in cells that were treated with uh, DDCBE as shown by the, uh, the, the really low uh, gray bars here. And lastly, the ability to use DDCBEs to model disease mutations uh, in the mitochondrial DNA is extremely useful if we want to study the disease etiology or to facilitate any preclinical testing of drug candidates. So 
For instance, uh, mutations in genes encoding for complex one subunits are thought to be pathogenic in some cases of rare uh, thyroid and kidney tumors. So working with Professor Vamsi Muta and Dr. Anna Kotris from MGH, uh, we used DDCBE to install, uh, selectively install a C to T edit in the mitochondrial ND4 gene, as shown by the light blue bar uh, on the left. And that mutation is known to install a premature stop codon in the ND, uh, ND4 gene. And as consistent with the complex one disruption, uh, cells treated with ND4 DDB, uh, DDCBE, shown by the blue line here, had lower rates of oxidative phosphorylation, as well as decreased basal and uncoupled respiration rates. Uh, we also found that the protein abundance of complex one was lower than the, uh, the remaining components of the electron transport chain, as well as the activity of complex one uh, was decreased as well whereas the other uh, complexes remain unaffected. Uh, cells treated with DDCBE also did not appear to have altered levels of mitochondrial DNA, as well as the uh, uh, RNA levels. So th this set of results suggest that DDCBEs can be used to model heteroplasmic mutations in cell lines and potentially even in animal models. And its ability to be used as a gene therapy tool will have to be evaluated um, further um, as more research is being done in this area. So in summary, uh, we've developed mitochondrial-based editing by using a novel split double-stranded cytidine deaminase fields to tail repeats to enable the CRISPR-free C to T editing um, in, humans, in mitochondrial DNA of human cells. And we show that DDCBEs can edit your mitochondrial DNA efficiently give if the cytidine is in the uh, optimal position within the spacing region. And editing produces minimal indels as well as byproducts. Um, the off-target act uh, activity of DDCBEs are also low. And we showed that they could be used in both dividing and slow dividing cells to cause changes in the mitochondrial function. So I'd like to end off by thanking an amazing team of people. Um, so firstly, uh, Professor David Liu for being very supportive throughout the entire project, and Joseph and Marcos over at University of Washington for sharing with us the discovery of this novel uh, double-stranded DNA deaminase, uh, which provided the inspiration for developing a CRISPR-free mitochondrial base editor. And I'd like to thank Vamsi and Anna uh, for sharing their expertise with us on mitochondrial biology and helping us characterize the um, DDCBE treated cells. And I'd like to thank uh, you for your kind attention. I'll be happy to answer any questions uh, later on.